morning at the 8 o'clock Mass, we have the uh, first scrutiny of three, which we'll uh, take care of uh, for the three catechumens about to be baptized at Easter, uh, right after the homily. And uh, uh, we're going to continue with the sermons on uh, the um, sacrament reconciliation and the commandments, this time commandment fifth and six, uh, five and six rather, and uh, also uh, the benefits and the effects of the sacrament reconciliation. Uh, of course, here, uh, one comment on this uh, gospel this morning. Uh, this woman, uh, the Samaritan adulteress, uh, she offers great hope for the sinner. And this, of course, is very, very fitting for us because we as sinners are all on the same playing field, okay? So we're all level here in the fact that we are all sinners. Uh, and so then the woman here, though she is a sinner, uh, having several husbands there, as the Lord tells her, uh, she becomes an evangelist in a seven-part dialogue. She's the most catechized person by Jesus in the Gospel of John. And so as this conversation ensues, she goes from complete ignorance to knowledge, to enlightenment, to discipleship, to recognizing who Jesus is and goes back to her town and evangelizes the town and tells the town all about Jesus and they come out and see for uh, himself. So it's very exciting. Uh, very exciting how that works. And so then this is the great hope that the woman offers us is that she serves as a model of nothing greater than conversion. This is exactly what we are all about in the season of Lent. So the primary benefit of the sacrament of reconciliation is the forgiveness of our sins. Hold that thought, okay, because forgiveness of sins is very important, especially when I start getting into some of the details about the fifth and sixth commandment. You're going to need to take another deep breath because they are the harder, uh, the more difficult uh, uh, commandments of the ten to bear. Uh, so uh, this, of course, again, we have forgiveness of our sins available anytime, anytime, all the time. So it's very important to realize that in this context. So that's the primary benefit of the sacrament of reconciliation is forgiveness of our sins, plus it being a sacrament, it guarantees the certainty. So what do sacraments do, generally speaking? They guarantee a certainty of the thing signified. Uh, but it's not just a symbol or a sign, the sacraments. They are actually the reality that is signified. So if I have a symbol of the forgiveness of sins, it's actually the reality of the forgiveness of sins. And when I hear the, abs when I hear the words of absolution, then I have an ironclad guarantee that my sins are forgiven. I don't have to guess. All right? And that's something that the uh, sacraments offer us is this certainty about the reality that it represents or it actually is. Our offenses against God and neighbor are reconciled and restored uh, with our, all of our relationships are restored as well. We regain communion with God and in all of our relationships, which was weakened or lost by sin, and we're also reconciled with the church as sin also damages and breaks the relationships with the church, the body of Christ. So all this reconciliation goes on as well. Uh, how is personal conversion expressed? How do we express personal conversion? Well, in the woman at the well, you know, she listens to Jesus. It's through dialogue with Jesus. That's what we call prayer. Prayer is that opportunity, is that art form in which we engage with the Lord to advance our intimacy with our Lord. All right? Generally speaking, though, how is personal conversion expressed? You go to the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a simple answer, okay? That's a simple answer. How do I express my conversion? I go to the sacrament of reconciliation, all right? And so it's accomplished through that way. It's uh, what, uh, the means of the church that, is, uh, that the Lord has given it uh, to express our conversion. Uh, so only God forgives sins, okay? And Jesus himself has given his divine authority and power over sin to the apostolic ministry, his priesthood to men, who exercise the ministry of reconciliation in Jesus' name. Okay, this is the great gift of mercy that he gives to us. Great thing about the sacrament of reconciliation, it's repeatable. Okay, I can use it as often as I need it. All right, so the forgiveness of our sins does something else, of course. It reintegrates us back into the community of the people of God from which sin has alienated, alienated and excluded us. 
All right, this is what sin does, is it takes us away from the community of God. It separates us, separates us from our relationships, okay? It weakens those relationships, and if it's a mortal sin, then it cuts off completely. It alienates us from the people of God, the rest of the mystical body of Christ. Another benefit or effect of the sacrament of reconciliation that comes along with this forgiveness of our sins is a new possibility of conversion and recovery of the grace of justification. What's the recovery of the grace of justification? That's regaining the grace that we lost from the baptism, because we gain that baptismal grace in baptism. We have this grace of justification. We become children of God, but our identity, it's almost like we lose our identity uh, of being children of God through sin, and we regain that identity again, to become a child of God almost all over again. I say almost, our language falls short in describing that, but it restores that baptismal grace that has been weakened or lost through sin, uh, depending on which kind of sin it is. Now, to experience these benefits and effect of the sacrament reconciliation, we need three basic things, which is contrition, confession, and satisfaction. We kind of talked about confession and satisfaction last weekend. I'll cover these three things next weekend probably, I think. Um, But the main thing about contrition, there's perfect contrition, and then there's imperfect contrition. What's perfect contrition? Perfect contrition is perfect sorrow for sin arising from perfect love of God. All right, I am sorry for my sins because I have offended God, and he is, the, he is supremely good, and he deserves all human love. That is a perfect contrition. An imperfect contrition is still a real sorrow. I'm still sorry for my sins, but it's animated by something like the fear of the pains of hell, or the fear of losing heaven, or the fear of being punished by God in this life for our sins, or the fear of being judged by God. So it's Imperfect contrition is animated by fear, but nonetheless, it suffices for the sacrament of reconciliation. Either one will do. Actually, if it's perfect contrition, you don't have to go to confession except for once per year, all right? Uh, But the problem is, I wouldn't risk it. You can, all right? Pascal's wager, all right? It's better to go to confession, though, and hear the words of absolution, so I am certain of my forgiveness. The thing about perfect contrition is that we don't really know ourselves that well, to know, hmm, am I really truly sorry for my sins because I offended God's love, or am I really truly sorry for my sins because I really don't want to go to hell? Okay, <laughs> all right, so that's the difference is we can never really trust ourselves fully, so best practice, develop a good habit of going to confession on a regular basis. That way, whether my contrition is perfect or imperfect doesn't matter. My sins are going to be forgiven. Okay, that's what's important is that the sins are forgiven. So the whole power of the sacrament of reconciliation consists in restoring us to God's grace and joining us with him in what? In intimate friendship. We have a universal God who has created everything, and he has created each and every one of us as if we are the only person he has ever created in the history of the world. And he comes to us, and he wants to have this intimate friendship with us. And no matter how many times we turn away from him, he's always there waiting to restore us, to restore us, to restore us to his friendship and our life of grace as a son or daughter of his. And so then the purpose and effect of the sacrament is reconciliation with God. Uh, For those who receive the sacrament reconciliation with contrite heart and religious disposition, reconciliation is usually followed by peace and serenity of conscience with strong spiritual consolation. The sacrament of reconciliation brings about a true spiritual resurrection, restoring the dignity and blessings of the life of the children of God. That is, of course, uh, again, friendship with God It is our most precious gift to be friends with the Almighty God, friend of God. Okay, sin damages and breaks fraternal communion between people. It's another point that we have to realize is, uh, you know, sin could be what's causing our problems in our relationships. Relationships are like the pinnacle idol, if you will, of our culture. In other words, people place a lot of importance on relationships, and that's important. 
because relationships are important, all right? They are important. Relationship with God is important. Relationship with one another is important. We are created for love. We are created out of love, and we are created to love and be loved, all right? So relationships become very, very important. Sin damages those relationships, so we are unable to have good relationships, friendships, work relationships with other people, or partnerships with our spouses, or cooperate with our family members due to sin, all right? The sacrament of reconciliation repairs and restores them all instantaneously. Okay? That's how awesome the sacrament is. The sacrament of reconciliation has a revitalizing effect on the entire life of the church, which suffered from the sin of one of her members. You can talk in terms of personal sin, my personal sin, your personal sin, but really, sin's not personal because we're all connected in the mystical body of Christ. So when one member sins, then the all, all of the body suffers, okay? The body of Christ, the entire church. And likewise, when one member repents, then all of the body rejoices, all right? There's a real benefit to that in the entire church, all right? This could be one explanation as to why is the church the way it is today? Well, because people have lost the use of the sacrament of reconciliation. Okay? That could be one of the major explanations as to why uh, the church is the way she is and why the world is the way it is. Maybe if the people in Washington uh, for our government uh, use the sacrament of reconciliation more often, we might have a different understanding or a different understanding of government and a different understanding of what it means to actually compromise. Um, so, uh, nonetheless, we won't get too political, at least not this morning. Uh, this, so the sacrament of reconciliation also does what? It reestablishes and re-strengthens the sinner in the communion of saints, okay? Even being made stronger by the exchange of spiritual goods among all the living members of the body of Christ. Are the saints members of the body of Christ? Yes. Yes, God is a God of the living. Are the saints alive? Yes, saints are alive. They are part of our body, all right? They are a part of our body as well, and we share in that communion with them. But if we sin, it weakens, and if we have commit a grave or mortal sin, it cuts off our communion with the saints as well, and we can regain that communion with the sacrament of reconciliation. The sinner's reconciliation leads to other reconciliations as he is, first of all, reconciled within himself, within his self's inmost being, where he regains his inmost truth. Something about what sin does is it also clouds our judgment, all right? And we're not able to really see clearly the truth of certain situations because of sin. It ruins our judgment. It's like worse than alcohol, you know? It starts to cloud our perceptibility and our judgment. So we regain clarity of the truth through the regular use of the sacrament of reconciliation as well. So uh, the sinner is also reconciled with his brothers and sisters, uh, whom he has in some way offended or wounded. And of course, he's reconciled with the church and something new I learned and he's reconciled with all of creation, that all of a sudden creation is better because the sinner is reconciled to God uh, and through the sacrament of reconciliation, and, and he reconciles with all of creation. And maybe nature would treat us better also if we maybe had a better use of the sacrament of reconciliation. Who knows? Things to think about, but it says in the Catechism of the Catholic Church that the sinner is also reconciled with all of creation. It's a beautiful idea. So in the sacrament of reconciliation, the sinner places himself before the merciful judgment of God, anticipates in a certain way the judgment to which he will be subjected at the end of this earthly life, for it is now in this life that we are offered the choice between life and death, and it is only by way of the road of conversion that we can enter the kingdom from which one is excluded by grave sin. So in converting to Christ through penance and faith, the sinner passes from death to life and does not come to judgment. We'll all be judged at the end of our life, but the point is, is that we're going to be judged on our unrepentant sin. All right, that's why the virtue of repentance from our sin becomes so important. The primary effect of the sacrament of reconciliation is restoration to the life of grace. Again, a reflowing of the very life of Christ in us. And it also reconciles us with God, with the greater mystical body of Christ, restores our communion with God and all the other people 
around us whom we have relationships with. It recreates and restores our relationships and friendships with God and others and strengthens us even more to resist the temptations to sin and the devil. Okay, that's what else it does. Is It's like spiritual warrior training. So finally, the fifth and sixth commandment. Okay, so take a breath. All right, these are not easy to uh, always talk about or uh, hear about. The fifth commandment, of course, is thou shalt not kill, which, you know, involves much more than just killing. It commands the safeguarding of one's own life and bodily welfare and that of others and the control of our anger. So if we get angry, we, there's an appropriate and an inappropriate response to anger, if you will. Inappropriate, appropriate, that's a relative word, all right? But we don't kick holes in the wall. We don't throw things through windows. We don't strike anybody, okay? When we're angry, those would be inappropriate responses to anger, all right? So the fifth commandment commands us to control our anger, to respond to it appropriately. If I go for a run, that would be an appropriate response to anger, okay? Um, so let's see. Um, uh, so unjust killing. Now, the t- church still does teach on uh, self-defense. So if I have to kill somebody in defense of my life or defense of somebody else's, uh, or my, someone I love, uh, then that is actually moral. All right, there's no sin in that. It's, that's why it says unjust killing. Uh, suicide, attempts at suicide. Uh, this is also a sin uh, because these are, these are all, Fifth Commandment covers any really sin against life or being open to life. All right, so abortion, of course, is on here. Uh, now, abortion, you got to be careful with suicide. And all these things, they, they're very touchy subjects because they affect all of our lives. All right, so suicide, of course, um, people are not in their rational mindset when they do that. They're neither really in their rational mindset when they uh, commit abortion, okay? Usually fear or the, uh, uh, um, the fear of death or survival instinct is operative, okay? Uh, you know, um, you've heard the phrase, you know, if you come home pregnant, I'm going to kill you, all right? That's from the father, right? And if the child believes that, then it becomes a survival instinct, okay? And so this is the thing about it. Um, assisted suicide is also known as euthanasia. That's helping someone kill themselves. Uh, artificial contraception uh, in uh, conjugal relations, uh, this is uh, also against life. In vitro fertilization, uh, this is also immoral because of the uh, way in which uh, certain selective choices are made for the abortion. If like five pregnancies take place and they only want one child, they have to eliminate the other four. Also, it requires an act of masturbation on the male's part. Uh, to gain that seminal fluid, uh, and then it also uh, separates the unitive aspect from marriage. Okay, the two goods of marriage, the way God has designed sexuality, is uh, uh, unitive and creative. So you have to have both of those uh, parts there for the act to be natural and moral. Uh, tubal ligations uh, and vasectomies, those are, uh, those are a result of a sterilization of the production of life. Those also are immoral. Uh, and uh, fist fights, okay, fist fights also uh, to truly uh, harm somebody uh, with your, phys- with your uh, f- fists or physically attack. Uh, drinking and driving uh, also is another activity that places life or limb or the self or that of others in danger, okay? Uh, Operating a motor vehicle uh, irresponsibly. This places uh, someone at risk. Uh, So the the whole understanding behind the fifth commandment is the preservation and the protection of life, okay? And to be open to life, and that's what's behind that, all right? And so these things, again, like I said, take a breath because, okay, you you have to get to the sixth commandment here finally, but the forgiveness of sins is available all the time. Keep that in mind, no matter how far we fall or, or how bad the sin is, and sin is sin when it comes to God, all right? He's ready to forgive it, so we have to keep that in mind. Sixth commandment is uh, the other hard one, is thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, okay, this commands chastity in word and deed. Of course, chastity is the virtue that moderates the desire for sexual pleasure according to faith and right reason. So then uh, this is uh, avoiding the occasions of sin also falls under the sixth commandment. If I know that I'm going to be weak in some area, uh, then I don't go there. I don't put myself in that proximate occasion of sin. That could also be a sin in itself. And for instance, I don't go to a strip club to evangelize strippers if I have a problem with lust. 
Okay, I don't go there. <laughs> so then that would be something very practical to apply. You need to know yourself, okay? All right, we have a really creative way of rationalizing uh, in ourselves and being in places that we know we shouldn't. All right, so we have to be careful about that. So of course, adultery uh, is a, a conjugal relation uh, with someone other than your spouse. Fornication, fornication is uh, uh, a conjugal relation um, with someone uh, before marriage. Uh, of course, all masturbation is a selfish act that would be uh, a sin as well. Uh, homosexual acts, okay, those, again, um, very, uh, inter- very, un- very much we need to understand this. Uh, we separate the act from the person, okay? The church does not condemn uh, people who suffer from same-sex attraction, all right? This is a very uh, 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 touchy subject as well to talk about, especially in a sermon or homily, all right? And, and all these things need to be understood and handled personally as well, okay? Uh, so that's something to, to understand as well. Uh, sexually impure or unchaste actions alone or with others uh, or with animals, okay? Believe it or not, it happens from time to time. Uh, so pornography, movies that promote adultery, fornication, impure or unchaste sexual behavior. Uh, any physical sexual expression outside of marriage is a sin, especially if it has the intention to arouse self or other. It's the way God designed sexuality, all right? And it goes to show you that you're looking in here and it's like, wow, this is like I've never heard before or we never really thought this was really actually that true. Uh, it goes to show you how much our culture has numbed itself to, you know, regular practices that have become acceptable. But remember, God tells us that I am holy, all right? And you are to be holy, for I am holy. You are my children, all right? And so then the understanding of this is that, yes, God calls us to holiness. He calls us to conversion. And he does not leave us without the grace to be faithful and successful, all right? We can choose not to sin in every temptation, This is the understanding that we have, that grace is available for the moment and that we can resist sin every time, but we don't, okay? And God knows that, and that's why he instituted the sacrament of reconciliation, the great sacrament of mercy for us, so that we can always go back to be forgiven and start anew. This is the great mercy of God. The forgiveness of sins is always available. He calls us to what? To greater inner freedom because what what sin does is it enslaves us. It enslaves us to our passions. It enslaves us to this world. And what God wants to do is he wants his children to live freely, joyfully, maximizing their happiness. And we do that through this regular practice of the forgiveness of our sins, the great sacrament of mercy. 